Okay, welcome back to Patriot to the Core podcast. I am Thad Forrester, and I've got on this early Sunday morning with me Army chaplain, or maybe former Army chaplain. You'll have to to clear that up with me, Justin. This is former <laughs> podcast guest from number fifty three, Justin Roberts. So, Justin, Thank yeah, you are. Did you did you get out of the Army? Did you retire? Or what was your status with the Army? Yeah, I got out of the Army. It was like I spent about ten years. In. Okay. Um, a good bit of that was, uh, uh, six years active and about four years reserve. Okay. All right. So now what really drew me to you is your, your post from Ukraine and you're over there to, you're in Lviv, if I've pronounced that correctly. Will you just, yeah. I guess, I, well, there's a lot of, that's what I want to talk about here, but this isn't your first time in combat in a combat zone. So can you yeah. just yeah, give us a little bit of background of, I know you're, you were a chaplain, but, but why yeah. you're even able to do what you're doing. Yeah. So my quick history, uh, a former army chaplain, uh, my second master's though is in media arts and communication with a focus in writing. And so, uh, when I was in Afghanistan as a chaplain, I wound up putting together a documentary during the combat operations called no greater love. And we released that film out theatrically, screened it before White House, Congress, film festivals, and then released it out to theaters. And it's now currently on Amazon Prime. And it's, again, it's called No Greater Love. And that film was just about the lessons that I learned from the soldiers that I served with. And so since that time, when I got out, of, when I got out of the military out of, at 2015, I directed two more feature films, uh, one that's going to be released uh, a little bit later this year and then one in the spring of next year and uh the one that i'm currently filming as well so it'll be three films in total that are going to be coming out uh and this one's going to be about the operations that are ongoing you know, the combat operations that are ongoing in ukraine and just about the soldiers who are at the front and and putting in the fight and uh then i will also be doing a tv series uh, two seasons um, about the humanitarian efforts that are happening here in Ukraine as well. And that series is called Do Good. And that is to try to raise awareness and support for the humanitarian operations. And that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. I, I, I own No Greater Love because I got it on DVD when it came out. Was it 2018? Mm -hmm. It was around there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I think that's, that's what I remember. And um, I pre-ordered it. So yeah, yeah, it's good to know it's on uh, Prime, Amazon Prime now, too. Mm -hmm. I think I watched it again on Amazon Prime when I saw that a few years ago. It's a good Memorial Day movie. Yeah, and it's an award-winning movie, too. It's it's done very well, hasn't it, from the critics? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it had a really good team on this one, too. And, um, you know, of course, The Soldiers Keeping Me Safe, to film. <laughs> they deserve a lot of credit. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. So, just uh, Justin, how did you even? I think about logistics here. How did you even physically get to where you're at in Ukraine? And I know you, you moved around at least some. How did you get there? You're talking <clears throat> about airports, flights, and cars, and all uh, that kind of thing. I mean, like if uh, whenever the war kicked off, um, what triggered it for me? I have a buddy uh, who is with Aerial Recovery. Uh, Jeremy Locke, I heard about the operations that they were doing, rescuing kids from orphanages. So uh, I, I was holding my daughter and I felt this twinge just um, that she's safe, she's fine, but there's kids that are over here that are not safe and not fine. And uh, the best thing that I can bring to um, a problem is telling stories and trying to raise awareness and support to move decision makers and, and move helpers. Uh, to mobilize towards a cause. So I let the wife know I'm going and she's like, I already knew you were gonna go. <laughs> so so uh, I had to then quickly do a fundraising uh, for the film and put all the, the basic steps. Cause like anytime you do a movie, it's like start, it is starting a business cause you have to have a, an LLC for the film. You have to do fundraising for the film, a business plan. You have to go through all that stuff. But I had to do that stuff very, very quickly. Uh, but I've done it before. I've done it several times. So it's not new to me, but it's, it's just a lot of work. And uh, then you have to also go and raise funds during a uh, financial downturn. 
And so that's not easy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I got all that stuff done really quickly. And then I reached out to one of my friends, Hank Barb. Uh, he's the lead singer for the rock band Three Beers, and he's a former 82nd Airborne medic and uh, my best friend. And I said, hey, man, I'm I'm going to Ukraine. Do you want to go? And he's like, yeah, sure. So uh, he decided to come with me for a bit. And then uh, we flew from out of Houston to uh, Warsaw. And then from uh, actually now from Houston to Istanbul and then from Istanbul to Warsaw and then drove from Warsaw to Lviv. Um, but when we first got here, we've been here for three, I've been here for three months. Um, when we first got here, we went straight from Lviv to Kiev. And then uh, from Kiev, uh, we've been to Mykolaiv, Kharkiv, uh, oh, all along the Donbass uh, in the trenches and um, and then back. And so most of my combat filming I've already gotten done. And most of the, the military filming I've gotten done. And so now I'm back in Lviv to do some writing and to put the film together. And then I, I still have to do another trip out to the front uh, to get a little bit more footage and then I'll have everything in the can and the documentary will be done. How do you get out there into the action? Usually it's partnering with the military. Like I come up with the idea and I talk with them and then uh, we have a military escort, usually just one person. Okay. Uh, the guy that we've been rolling with, he looks just like Sean Connery and uh, he's former Marine recon on the Ukraine side. So exact kind of perfect person to have for these because we have to keep the, the team slim. Um, what you have to worry about over here is like, if you have a lot of vehicles, that's a target. And that's, you're going to get incoming artillery. This is an artillery fight. This is not small arms. Um, so drones and artillery and grads. So uh, rockets. And so uh, I try to keep it down to one vehicle, a small team. We get in, we get what we need, and then we get out. What about any close calls that you've had? Is it is it numerous? Is it few or what? Just like three. Um, we had Russian mortar team call... Uh, fly a drone over us and then call mortars on our position. And then two other times I've had um, artillery coming in and coming like close sector, but not on our sector, not on our grid square. And that's the weird thing. It's like, it's, it's not, it's hard to measure the close calls because it's measured like a, in Afghanistan, it's measured in feet, right? Cause it's small arms uh, over here. It's measured in sectors. Like, you know, 50 yards that way or 100 yards that way, they're, they're calling you for fire. But that's just like for artillery, that's just like, you know, like it could be if they just dialed it in just a little bit to the other way or they, they flew a drone over and then they're calling it in your grid square, then you're gone um, unless you're well Im embedded into a trench and you're really lucky. But um, then that's just a game of roulette. So the fight here it's more devastating than like the small arms fights, but you're not going to be getting like a whole lot of close calls. Cause if they're, if they're hitting your grid square, the chances are they're, they're going to get you, uh, with that artillery. Um, you might, you might, if you're low enough, then you might make it out and you might be lucky, but you're going to be rattled. And that's what we've seen is just like when it comes in and when they hit, it's just mass casualties. So that's why the Ukrainian side and the Russian side are losing so many people. The artillery is a very different kind of fight. And uh, I, was, I was trying to figure out like, how to explain it and the best, the feel of it. And it feels kind of like small arms. It feels like poker. Like you can kind of control your hand. You, you have some control over what you're doing. You might get unlucky. You might get lucky. Uh, whereas this, it feels closer to roulette. You know, <laughs> it's just a whole lot of luck. And you're just hoping that you're not... Like the first time, though, the second that we heard a drone, we immediately got out of there. You knew how high was the drone? It wasn't very high. It's like it was high enough. It was low enough for us to hear it. Yeah. Because we were we lifted off a drone thinking that we were going to be fine <laughs> and uh, that we were not that close to the enemy. We were in the gray zone, but we we're like, we, we should be fine. We weren't fine. <laughs> so we heard a second drone and we we're like, Oh crap, it's time to go. 
And uh, so we ran to the van, booked it out of there, and then we heard kadoom, 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 like right in that same area that we were at. And now, do you uh, think are, are they they had footage of you from the drone, but are they also watching you from a from a, a high point, or was it just old images then by that point from them? Yeah, it's just old. old they just call in the coordinate, so okay. that that person the second that they see. Uh, a target that a valid target then they'll ping that you know that location um and call in those coordinates and then they dial it in really fast so you have like a minute two minutes uh to get out of there and then you know fairly accurate fire i mean they're they're, they're pretty decent mm -hmm. um so it's an issue of uh, staying in motion um, you know how like it, like Afghanistan, Iraq, you'd kind of do the sniper walk if you're like staying stationary, you know, you just kind of staying in motion. You just have to do that in an exaggerated way. If you're in the gray zone, if you're in the areas where they can call for fire, it's just best not to stay in any one location. And if you do park your vehicle, you need to park your vehicle undercover. Okay. And probably yeah. not sit in the vehicle then too, right? You're you're yeah. out moving. You're you're yeah. moving. You're staying in motion um, yeah. because it's really hard for them to co call for fire on a, a moving target. They're just not going to do that. So you stay in motion, and then if you do find cover, I mean, if you do park, you you park under a tree, you park under something to where the the drones can't see it, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and then just hope that the drone didn't follow you into that position yeah so you're yeah. you're talking about small arms fire and artillery uh there are I, there's a lot of women that listen to to this so will you explain that i'm guessing small arms fire you're talking about like an ak or and maybe an ar or something like that and then oh. or what, what, tell I, me tyrannosaurus rex yeah what's tyrannosaurus. that Tyrannosaurus rexes uh t-rex no, no arms no, these small arms no the, uh, <laughs> No, so that's, yeah, that's going to be AK-47s and, um, yeah, yeah, weapons like that. I mean, like, you know, we had our M4s, they had AK-47s in, Af in Afghanistan. Okay. And then uh, it's heavy weapons over here is the primary. And so the way Russia works is they call it artillery fire. They use grads, which is rockets, um, and then they push in tanks and they try to flatten everything before they move the tanks in as much as possible. So the, uh, the areas, the gray zones, those are the areas that are contested and where a lot of the artillery and mortars are being called in at. So, um, th that's the middle ground and it's closer to like world war one, where there's just so much devastation that it looks inhospitable. And, uh, it's weird to see modern cities and modern homes as a part of that rubble, but that, that is a situation. Justin, how do you describe the situation? I, I'm trying to like, for people like me, we've never been in a war zone. How do you describe the situation to your wife and to your kids or to someone else who's just, you know, average American like me? Yeah, I mean, it's like in some of those areas, it looks like the apocalypse. I mean, like it is so much devastation. Um, you know, so many. What's weird is like when it it looks like the places in America where it's like modern homes, modern buildings, things that you're used to, and then everything is completely wrecked and destroyed. Uh, everything has been exploded, set on fire, um, rid, riddled with bullets. It, it's just so odd. Um, I've been in disaster zones. It looks like a disaster zone, but you know that it's man-made. You know, like a, my home was hit in Lake Charles, Louisiana by Hurricane Laura and then Hurricane Delta. So my city, my hometown city just got hit so hard. 20% of the population had to leave. You know, um, it was just a lot of wreckage. And that's what this looks like to me, except that instead of with water, it's fire and just straight up concussive explosions, you know, that just shake and knock down the building. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, it's very, very odd. But the thing that 
goes through your mind too is that these are not just buildings these are people's homes uh, they don't have typically home insurance so their life savings was often put into that home you see that they had to leave so quickly so so much stuff was left behind you know they just packed what they could that night and then they left and so you just see so many personal belongings and they haven't been able to come back to it because you know the, the fight is ongoing so there's so much humanity left in these places but it's so eerie for it to be a ghost town with just mm. wreckage and destruction so it, it's hard to explain um yeah well how would you contrast that to afghanistan how did you describe the your time in afghanistan to your family yeah it's it, these are completely two different wars so like afghanistan was uh there was no line of the war that wasn't like them on one side and us on the other it was just everything was mixed together and uh afghanistan has been at war for decades and decades and decades so they haven't had the ability to really develop the infrastructure of their country to build all these you know uh, modern stores modern homes all these kind of luxuries that we have so it's a very different kind of experience. Uh, you're, you're stuck on a base in Afghanistan and then you go do your operations. Whereas here, you know, I would be at the front, you know, <laughs> getting mortars dropped on our location and uh, moving around and then trying to avoid a, a firefight that was going on in front of us and trying to steer our way, you know, to safety. And then 10 minutes later, be drinking a latte at a coffee shop and my my brain does not know how to process that yeah <laughs> it, it doesn't feel real but it is happening because there is this static line and a lot of people like struggle to process that because they think that well you shouldn't have coffee and lattes in a, a war zone in a country but they're not shutting society down you know, people still have to eat, you know, yeah. you know, still have to have jobs and, and life still has to go on to have the economy to fund the war and to feed the people. And so the restaurants have to remain open and they're going to serve lattes and coffee and all those things that we would too. And uh, so I had one person comment like, well, if they, if they're drinking coffees, it must not be that bad. I'm like, it's worse than Afghanistan. It's worse than Iraq. You know, this is the casualties are way higher. You know, um, in 20 days, they're going to have in, in just 20 days, they have more casualties than we did in 20 years of war. Hmm. So our brains are really struggling to process this because that is the way artillery fights and long range fights like this happen. It's a, an entire grid square of human beings deleted. All those lives, all those lives are gone. And if you're in the wrong sector, you're gone. You're just gone. And um, it is so hard for the human brain to really process that many losses that quickly. Um, we have to turn all those lost lives into numbers rather than human beings to really process it. Yeah, that's what I've been trying to, to figure out is, yeah, are they going about their day? So you said businesses are open, you know, like mm -hmm. grocery stores, malls. I, I guess yeah. it depends just where you are. Some of them, they're just going about life as normal or, or what's I it walked, like? I've walked through so many of these places, like schools, just burnt up schools. Um, you just pray that it happened at night, but I don't know. And uh, shopping areas, like open area, open shopping areas is where a lot of, uh, they, they do their shopping. And in Kharkiv, I was walking through one that was just completely burnt up. And it was so odd because like in Kiev and then here in Lviv, I would walk through those areas and you see grandmas, you know, selling their vegetables and fruit. You see people selling clothes and just any kind of items that you would want. This is where a lot of them will buy their stuff. And it's so alive with people. And, you know, at some point, the one in Kharkiv, same thing happened because Russia has been trying to target civilian areas. They waited when it was most populated and then bombarded it to burn it all up. And all those people died. What and about so it's like for us? Yeah. 
Go ahead. Go ahead, Justin. No, it's like just a, you pick a, a populated place for us, like a football game, like a high school football game. Uh, Russia would target that. And they would wait until everybody is over there. And then they would just blast it with artillery and trying to kill as many of those civilians as possible to try to cause as much terror as possible. Mm -hmm. That's what's think, happening here. Yeah. So Ukraine, is it about the size of Texas? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So obviously there's a lot, there's a, you know, a diverse state with, with, with different landscapes, mm -hmm. populated areas, very rural areas. What yeah. about someone in Ukraine that lives you know, they've got 50 acres of land or something. They have a farm. No one else is near them. Do they feel any safer? And are they, a lot of them staying there and can go in about their day or have they left yeah. also? Yeah, it's the the people who could financially leave did. Um, well, a lot that could financially leave did. But there's this weird... Uh, situation i don't know if you could call it a dichotomy but it's like there's this weird the the living standard in ukraine is higher from what i'm seeing than it is in america it's better food more organic food people have more access to medical without having to go bankrupt um education's free i mean like it's there's a lot of these luxuries that they have with ease that we don't have um at least at a little bit higher standard than what i was experiencing in the us um but their dollar is weaker so if they go elsewhere they don't have as much money they're poor but here they're great you know so it's mm -hmm. this weird kind of bubble that they exist in here financially and uh the problem for a lot of the ukrainians is that uh, they couldn't financially leave like that farmer if the crops don't come in, he could be starving next year. So the crops have to come in. He does not have the finances to just, you know, go take a, a long-term vacation. And to Ukraine, you know, Poland is rich. Now to a lot of the other countries in, in Europe, Poland's not as wealthy. And so, you know, Ukraine financially has, you know, coming out of communism, it really was struggling financially to play catch up to Western Europe and still is trying to play catch up. So a lot of those people don't have the ability to just up and leave. And there was one story that really caught me above the rest. I was driving along, we passed by a bomb crater that was massive. It was like the size of a swimming pool. And so we had to drive around it. And as we were driving along this road, uh, I told the driver to stop because I saw a mom with her kid and the, and she was teaching this, you know, four-year-old, five-year-old, I guess, you know, he was a young, young guy uh, to ride his bike. And they were riding their bike towards that crater and they knew it was there. And this kid, he had no, it didn't look like he had any awareness of the war on his face whatsoever. His face was just beaming just joyful, just happy. And he was so excited to be learning to ride his bike. And his mom was having to kind of guide it and keep him balanced. And I looked at her and in her eyes, she looked so worn, so tired. And somehow she was shielding him from the reality of this war. And they were living in a place that is constantly getting bombed, constantly getting hit by artillery and civilian locations are being targeted. And for whatever reason, she can't take him out of there because they can't afford to leave. And so somehow she's just keeping him unaware of this war. And they continue to ride the bike towards the crater. And that's when I lost sight of him. And that that is so strange to me, like mm -hmm. that reality. Yeah. Yeah, I'll say. What about one of the the pictures that you shared was uh, of, of a priest's home near a church. And you said it's a, it was a grenade trap. What is a grenade trap? I mean, it was, a, there was obviously a big hole there, but I've never heard that term before. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, 
the you cut out on that last part. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. The what is a grenade trap? I haven't heard that term before. So it's a, it's a booby trap. It's like a they'll take a grenade, like pull the pin, but then make sure that it stays uh, that 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 lever stays connected to where it doesn't trigger it just yet. And so then they'll tie a string to it or something like that, and to where once a person opens up something or moves something, then the the, the lever releases mm -hmm. and the, the fuse is, you know, it, the timing goes off and yeah. then it blows up. So the uh, they had left these traps uh, for the civilians, and this is near Bucha, uh, near Kiev. And uh, we were talking to the priest and they had left that inside his home just for him. And then not too far from there, they also left one in a washing machine um, for you know, the mom of the family. Like they went inside and put it, or was the washing machine outside? The inside. Wow. Yes. Yeah, they, they would come into these houses and just raid them, raid them and raid them for anything, any food, anything they wanted to steal. And then they will leave traps uh, just to blow up civilians. Wow. How many civilians like that are fighting back or do you think are just armed and they're just ready if, in case they come into their home as they're, you know, moving through an area? I'd, I'd say it's like about a, I mean, a lot of the civilians do get armed and I would say, but they have to do so like, you know, officially, like they don't have just like anybody can go buy a gun kind of situation here. Um, but I think it's close to like, as far as civilians being mobilized, it's about you have your regular military, and then you have territorial defense. Um, hmm. That's almost like the National Guard. And then you have another organization called Right Sector, which is just civilians that are not connected to the government, but are fighting. And I would say it's about 25% um, on Right Sector, and kind of like just mobilized civilians. 25% to, you know, 30, like to a third. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a massive amount. And so a lot of these people are just being funded by donations from local citizens who are just funding right sector. And they hold the line too. Everybody is kind of just engaged in this fight. How would you describe the morale of the Ukrainians that you've encountered, Justin? It's high. Uh, they, it's almost kind of like if somebody invaded America, uh, We'd be angry. Uh, we would fight until we die. We're not giving up our land. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So, so people have to understand that they have the same principle, but the difference between us and them is they had their grandparents telling them horror stories of what communism was like, you know, 24 million people dying from starvation in Ukraine under communism, Russian communism, uh, people having to eat family members. All those stories are remembered here and all of those things were documented and facts. They starved. They were murdered. They were raped. It was genocide. And uh, Ukraine experienced that just a couple of generations ago. Yeah. So they, they know all this and now they have freedom from it. And now they see their, they were just starting to kind of get their own identity and their feet on the ground and building their own country apart from communism. And then this invasion happens. So they're not going to stop fighting. Um, it's not going, it's never going to end if, until Russia leaves. And because even if Russia magically somehow undid all of their, their jacked upness and started getting their act together and reform their military 100% to be an effective combat force instead of the travesty that it is, then somehow they defeated the Ukraine military. They're not going to take the population. Uh, the only way they could do that is to completely wipe out the population, which the world would not allow. So this is not a winnable situation anymore. Uh, I don't know if it ever was. The only thing that could have won it is if Zelensky had fled, the government had collapsed, and everybody yeah. had kind of given up. Even still, 
that would have been a situation kind of like in Afghanistan, where it's like, then you're just guerrilla warfare for the next 20 years. You know, it, it, it's just not, even at that situation, it wouldn't have been very winnable. So uh, now it's just impossible for them. Well, I want to share something that you, sh that you posted uh, recently. Um, let me see here. Can you still see me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. This is, this is from, uh, this is four days ago. I'm reading this off of LinkedIn and I'm sure it's on uh, Facebook too, and probably Instagram, Justin. So uh, it says, uh, this is an excerpt. What I've learned from the trenches in the Donbass is that the, the discourse on this war needs to take into account the Ukrainian people as much as the government. We need to understand that this assault was the last straw and ethically, we need to consider what we would do if we were in Ukraine's situation. When government leaders ask Ukraine to negotiate and give concessions, would they give up a land to Russia if, a similar, if in a similar situation? Would they just give up and submit? Would some of them, maybe some of them would. The strength and ethics of, of nations can be measured in how they advise. But I know that my own nation wouldn't submit an inch of ground to another country trying to steal it. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, think you, some countries. I think some countries would. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Because they they don't have a backbone, mm -hmm. and uh, America would not. It just it, we won't. And uh, if a president tried to, we would fire that president. We would impeach him immediately, and then come back to the fight. And uh, that, for us to be asking Ukraine to do something we would ourselves would not do, is unethical. Yeah. That's right. So it's, yeah. Yeah. And like, that's, that's what, um, has been so tragic in listening to foreign dignitaries, like try to convince Zelensky to submit, to concede, to just give up Putin something to where the situation can end, but they're not doing it because it's in the best interest of Ukraine. No, they're doing it because it's in the best interest of that oil deal or that gas deal that they need mm -hmm. and uh, america has been trying to warn uh western europe to step away from russia as its source of energy we've been giving this warning for years and years and because we foresaw that a situation like this could happen and nobody quite predicted that it would happen in this way but that that dependency has given Russia too much control over Western Europe. And that is why they have been so slow in providing support to Ukraine, but also so slow in cutting off the oil and gas with Russia, which has kept up the Russian economy uh, to continue this fight. And so this, this does become a moral question and an ethical issue. They were warned. They continue to do business with a government that they knew was aggressive, corrupt, and um, going to attack somebody at some point. And they saw this. Everybody kind of saw the warning signs on this. And America kept on giving the warnings, saying, hey, it's coming. It's coming. You need to get yourself ready. They're not going to be a good friend to you. And if you're dependent upon them, you're going to put us all in a bad situation. And they did not listen to those warnings and now we are in the situation that we are in and so now they are they pushed that problem kicked that can down the road saying no nah, we're not going to listen to you we're not going to listen to you and now what was predicted has come about so now they have to face an, a more difficult ethical choice of do they support a tyrannical government that is committing genocide rape murdering children doing these awful things, and I am witnessing these things, do they support that government with money by buying that energy, that oil and gas, or do they cut it off and then have to deal with the heavy burden of not having that oil and gas? And that is painful because that is going to hit them very hard economically. But if, they, if Ukraine doesn't win, that means Russia would win. And even if Russia somehow convinces Zelensky and the groups to let them keep Crimea, 
That means that oil and gas in Crimea then becomes Russia's oil and gas. And then we're back into square one, where Russia is the energy provider for Western Europe. Now, if Ukraine can win Crimea back, then that it becomes the energy provider for Western Europe. And that is a better situation because that is somebody who's not going to look at invading Poland, invading Lithuania, and on strong arming Germany and France. So we have to, instead of looking at the next quarter, and that's always our biggest problem financially, is it's always just looking at the next quarter so we can re report profits to our shareholders. We have to look years down the road here that Ukraine be could become the energy provider for Western Europe, and that'll balance out against Russia. It then becomes a shield against Russia's aggression and becomes a more stable partner going forward. And that is the big choice that these leaders are going to have to make, but that means that it's going to be short-term losses for long-term gains. Wow. Yep. All right. A few more questions, Justin. Uh, I just had one though. Um, I, I, I keep trying to put myself in, in the situation there as a Ukrainian. If I'm there hunkered down or I'm, I'm, I'm still there with my family, I've got a wife and three kids. They're young. And if the Russians are moving through an area, let's say, cause I know I've heard these stories too, of them going into homes and ransacking them. What if I see them coming up? What if they're on foot and they come and they're, uh, you know, do do you what's the thing to do I, I guess it depends how russia what what they're doing but do you go ahead and try to to kill a few of them and then know your family's going to be killed or or tortured or do you just do you let them come in and comply and steal what they want from your home what do you do i mean it's like it it just depends like uh they don't always kill everybody um some areas they've uh moved in and have tried to resettle the population. Um, uh, the rapes do happen a lot. Uh, it just depends on the unit, really. And it depends on like what kind of orders they've been given because if they've been given orders to just go and uh, you know cause havoc, let loose the dogs of war, then they've done that like they did in Bucha. And you know the, the war crimes are you know, documented, reported, and, and moving forward. But the, um, you would have to run, hide, and know that, like with the basement, if you go down into the basement, they typically don't like to go down there, but they're going to lob a grenade down there. And they might set fire to the place if they know you're down there. So then you've got another problem. Uh, they don't like to take the risk of going down there. And so they'll just torch the place. Um, but some, some of the families that, I mean, like the people that I've talked with, like I talked with this one old lady and they successfully hid and same with like another, like a one in Bucha that I've talked with, she successfully hid and they didn't come down to the basement. I think they lobbed a grenade down there, but you know, she wasn't hit. She was well protected. So she was fine. And then, uh, another same thing, like, but then they had, um, uh, their, their place eventually, like in Kharkiv, there was another couple I talked to who essentially did the same thing, but their home was set afire. Um, but they were, they were protected. They survived because their basement was kind of like offsite. And, um, yeah, so it's kind of a gamble, but that's why a lot of casualties are happening. And a lot of civilian casualties are happening. They get caught by the Russians and then, you know, people get hurt. Uh, but Russia is trying to, with some of these places, repopulate them and claim them as Russian territory, you know, Russian states. So uh, in those locations, they I don't think that they're trying to kill everybody, uh, but they are anything that is Ukrainian. They're taking down the signs. They are calling anything that was part of like Ukrainian culture. They're changing all the names, making sure only Russian Russian language is used and Russian names for everything. So they're really trying to make it theirs now. Yeah. Well, and for those people, I think they're going to be a little bit safer because they need that population. Okay. So I've got two questions here. My boys want to ask you a question. Yeah. Uh, they're very interested in this war and in Russians. And, and so my, what my son, Jack, 
asked, how old is the youngest fighter that you've seen or how young? Oh, gosh. Uh, fighters, I mean, like on the Ukrainian side, I mean, like 19, 20. Um, on, I did see like a, in Kharkiv, I saw this 14 year old kid wearing a helmet running around because there was a, uh, uh, a missile had landed on their driveway and they were trying to figure out how to get it moved. Uh, so that was just weird. <laughs> I was just like shocked by that, but yeah, it, that's typically the youngest age that I've seen is 19. Really? Okay. okay. What about all right, my son, Sam asked who's winning Ukraine. I mean, and it's, it's a war of attrition. Russia is making gains on land from time to time. And then Ukraine does a counter assault. Ukraine pushed them all the way out of Kiev. You push them all the way out of certain other areas. So Russia is now consolidated their fighting forces. But if Ukraine holds, it can continue to bleed them out. And that's what they're doing. And so, you know, Russia is losing a ton of guys just to get a few feet of ground. It's not sustainable. And uh, in the long run, it's not going to be sustainable. As long as Ukraine is willing to hold and willing to fight, it's going to win. <laughs> That's great to hear. So, Justin, what about in closing, your expectations before going there? Now you've been there three months. Have, have your priorities changed? And, and do you have what you need now in order to, to go back and, and finish this project? Yeah, I... I have more or less everything that I need. I mean, like I, I had to kind of go out there, get a feel for what's going on, figure out the story. Because like in documentary, you you come with a plan, but then that plan is not the plan that you're going to be filming. It always changes. So you have to figure out what the story is from talking with people because they're the ones, they are the story. And so you don't really know the full story until you get out there, unless it's like a historical documentary where everything is already documented. This is mm -hmm. stuff that's happening in real time. So I needed to embed, get to know the people and then figure it out. So now I have it fairly well figured out. I have to go back, do the rest of my filming, and then I'll be done with that. And then we'll be starting the TV show and we're identifying our organizations, uh, for, for that series. And that'll be 20 episodes focused on the humanitarian efforts that are going on here in Ukraine. So with each one of those organizations, we identify a hero, a person who's just making a, a radical difference on ground. And then we'll blast it out on the airwaves in the hopes to uh, raise support and awareness for that person. Yeah. Are these people, are these from all nations or are you focusing on Ukrainians? All nations. Yeah. And so whoever is doing good and is doing an amazing job and also being very ethical in how they manage the finances, that's who we want to support. Yeah. Man, yeah, that sounds great. Well, any idea when you're going back home? No idea. Okay. <laughs> it's, yeah, Russia gets a vote on that one too. And so uh, we, we're trying to figure that stuff out now because I've been out here for three months um, and I've got at least three more months to go, at least. And uh, this is an evolving situation. And so I need to follow the story as long as we can, but also try to figure out how we can do good while we're out here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but I'm very, I look forward to getting back home to my family. I'm sure. So how many kids do you have? Two, two. My daughter just turned nine. So I missed a birthday and I feel bad on that one. And then I got a son who's about to be five. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. man, God bless you for what you're doing. And, and what are you missing? Like, what do you miss as far as food goes or culture goes back home? You know, what? I miss I miss Tex Mex a, a lot. Like uh, I didn't realize how much I was going to miss Tex Mex. Well, I was born and raised in Texas, so sometimes you just feel like you're just going to get a burrito or something like that, something simple. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like going to a Chipotle, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I can't do that here. And um, I'm living in Louisiana, and I love gumbo. I love Cajun food. And I am missing that really. My mother-in-law's gumbo is just the best gumbo in the world. And, uh, there's, there's no way I'll find that here. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the <laughs> stuff I miss, but you know what? Georgian food is really, really good. Ukrainian food is amazing. 
um, I've learned to love that too. And so it's been great to experience all that, but I would love to also have Tex-Mex and, and Cajun food mixed all together. Just have some different options. Yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah. you there. And then, Hey, one last question. How are you finding places to live? Um, it's Airbnb. Really? Usually. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like a lot of people did flee. I mean, like it was a mat millions of people left this country. So they posted up their homes on Airbnb and uh, there was a lot of refugees who moved from the east to the west side of Ukraine, but it was such a massive amount of population that just up and left that there are places to rent. And, um, and like Lviv, I mean, it's a, it's like an Austrian city. I mean, it's, it's very modern, uh, gorgeous, you know, cobblestone streets, musicians, you know, out in the streets sometimes, uh, you've got amazing restaurants. It's become the gateway between war and peace. And so that's where you see a lot of these, you know, nonprofit groups moving into. Uh, so you do have a lot of modern luxuries and there are rocket attacks ever so often, but it's not, um, you know, it's not like being out on the east side where it's like several times a day kind of situation. Yeah. So you're not staying with a local family then you have a, a house. That yeah. Really yeah. I've got my own place and, okay. um, comfortable, you know, it's, I, I can't complain. This has been a, a very different war experience to compared to Afghanistan. Wow. Well, worse in some ways and then better in some ways. Well, what would you like to say in closing? I think it's, this is like a lot of other things that I've experienced that whenever people say that, you know, I, I, we support what you're doing. We support this, we support that in, in whatever cause it is. Um, the reflection I always hope that people have is like, how, you know, this is a chapter in history. If we are going to support Ukraine, how, like what actions are we donating? Or are we volunteering? Are we helping to get the word out? This is a war against tyranny. And if it is not won in Ukraine, then it will get moved to Poland. It will get moved to Lithuania. Russia has already said that. And Russia has invested over a billion dollars every single year on propaganda. And that propaganda has started fires in America, American politics. They've stated that as their objective, and they've been very successful on that. So a lot of the insanity that's going on to the U.S., the source comes from Russia. We are not as divided as we actually think we are. It's just that Russia has given a megaphone to the most extreme parts of America in order to try to divide us, to pull our attention away from international matters. So that way they could then move on in. And they've been very smart. This was our Pearl Harbor on the irregular warfare side, on the propaganda side. This was our Pearl Harbor. And we are just now slowly waking up to that this style of warfare, information warfare. And so, oh. Let me turn that off. <laughs> so that that is uh, what I'm hoping to get out there is that we wake up to this and we understand the landscape. Over a billion dollars every single year, that's more than Marvel Comics invest in the marketing of their films. And so we see this type of, of warfare regularly. We just need to wake up to it now. And we also need to start taking action. If we're going to support Ukraine, we need to do it with action. Well, what do the listeners need to do? How can they support you and follow you? Uh, if they find me on Do Good Army on TikTok, that's where I'm posting up uh, the most regular content. If they can find me on uh, Instagram as well, that's Justin D. Roberts. And that's where I'm posting up some content as well. But And on Facebook, it's Do Good Army. 